invitation to speak today. So, um, visual dynamic therapy in dermatology is very well established, um, and I'm going to talk about some developments to try and provide care close to home patients. And so, we've heard a lot about uh, the visual dynamic therapy reaction earlier today, and uh, as I say, I'm going to focus on skin and focus on trying to improve convenience for patients. So it's fortunate that in dermatology, because skin is so accessible and patients are generally well, that we're able to use topical pro-drugs of photosensitizers, and in particular, um, the methyl um, ester of aminoalbuminic acid, Netflix, and uh, ALA itself. And this just shows the strong crimson-red fluorescence of the induced photosensitizer, protocol for 9, in a superficial basal cell carcinoma, the sort of thing that we would uh, be our sort of bread and butter to treat, if you like, uh, after application of one of these programs. And conventional PDT, uh, really, its place in dermatology is in the uh, medical treatment arena of superficial uh, non-melanoma skin cancer, BCC, and uh, Bowen's disease, and which is carcinoma in situ, and actinic keratosis, or sun damage, uh, photo damage. Um, and conventional PDT has really been around since 1990, and uh, as I say, it's established in most dermatology departments. However, potential disadvantages of this for patients are that it does involve coming up to hospital for half a day, uh, so there's time involved for patients and staff, it's, it can be inconvenient, and pain with conventional PDT can be uh, mm -hmm. a problem. So if you ask patients what's important for them, the key things really are that um, treatment is comfortable, it's effective, and that it's as convenient as possible. So therein lies the challenge. And this just shows um, an image of a patient having uh, hospital-based PDT using an LED light uh, to head and neck. And these are some of the examples of the sorts of uh, lesions that would be suitable for treatment with PDT. And as you can see, apart from the one top right, which would have course be is just as amenable to cutting out or fibrouracil or a variety of other treatments, uh, you'll see that many of the lesions we're treating are not those that would otherwise be uh, conducive to excision by surgery or appropriately treated by surgery. So it's in particular large, superficial or multiple uh, and field change, uh, what, what we would call low risk lesions that don't have metastatic potential. But pain can limit the successful delivery of PDT with hospital-based treatment. And in particular, we find that pain, for example, of uh, bald heads which are covered in field change, carcinogenesis, and precancerous change can be quite painful if you uh, expose these to uh, red light irradiation in the hospital. Other indicators that may predict uh, painful experience with hospital-based PDT are very strong fluorescence. Um, and uh, actinic keratoses. And this pie chart bottom left really shows our historic data from when we started doing PDT uh, using proprietary ALA um, in the mid-1990s. And at that point, really, hospital-based PDT uh, was described as severely painful by 16% of patients and moderately painful by 50%. So, of course, that's not as good as we want. Uh, and in another publication, actually, they reported that almost half of all patients having hospital-based PDT needed some pain intervention. So uh, things have moved on a lot since then, and I'm going to just show some of the developments. One of the areas of development uh, uh, in terms of looking at ways to try and improve tolerance for patients is that it's very clear, and this is data from our own work, the superficial PCC treated with PDT, that if you reduce the irradiance, i.e. the rate at which you deliver your light, then uh, the percentage of patients who report uh, significant pain uh, drops off quite dramatically, particularly at these lower uh, irradiance rates, below 50 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So there are ways in which we can reduce irradiance. We can just get patients to sit for longer, to have the same dose delivered. Uh, that, of course, is not at all efficient for patient care, and it's not at all efficient for delivery of clinic services in a hospital setting. We can also develop, we have developed uh, low irradiance uh, portable devices that enable patients to have treatment at home. And we can also use um, the exemplar of daylight as a, a very low irradiance light source uh, for daylight PDT delivery. And I'm going to talk about these two areas. 
<coughs> so ambulatory PDT, this was work developed by ourselves in the photobiology unit, um, of Professor uh, Jimmy Ferguson and Harry Mosley initiated this work in conjunction with uh, Ida Samuels and the team at the University of St Andrews. And this has resulted in a spin-out <coughs> company, Ambicare Health. Um, and the, the purpose of developing these portable inorganic LEDs was really to provide convenience for patients. Um, and this is the very prototype device, uh, and this is the battery pack. And so what happens is the patient comes uh, up to hospital, has the uh, methyl aminoabinic acid cream applied to the lesion, to the skin, and then immediately this ambulatory LED device is adhered to the patient, to the, to the area. And the patient then goes home, and it's automated to be switched off for three hours, allowing the protoporphin 9 to build up. And then it automatically switches on and irradiates at very low irradiance, so around 7 milliwatts per centimetre squared, in contrast to hospital-based LEDs, which are generally around 85 milliwatts per centimetre squared. And it delivers a standard light dose of 75 joules per centimetre squared over a three-hour period. Um, in our very early work with this, one of the sort of uh, advantages that we noted was it seemed that these patients tolerated treatment extremely well. Uh, with uh, back then we looked and our median pain scores were only 1 out of 10, compared at that point with a historical conventional PDT coverage <coughs> of 6 out of 10 of hospital based treatment. So we were encouraged by that and we went on to do uh, some further <coughs> work introducing the use of ambulatory PDT into our clinical practice. And in our first experience in 64 patients with 81 lesions, we noted a pain score of 2. We had 26 additional patients who had both ambulatory and conventional PDT to compare with. And we found the ambulatory PDT scores were 1 out of 10, compared with the conventional at 6 out of 10. And so we were heartened about this, and most patients preferred Ambulite. Um, of course, this is only helpful if treatment is as effective as hospital-based PDT. But we looked at our efficacy rates and showed efficacy of 89%. Uh, at one year, which is actually at least as good as uh, all the reported guidelines and studies for conventional PDT. Uh, this just shows an example of a superficial PCC before and after PDT treated with uh, ambulatory PDT. We've then just completed, and in fact the data, this is the very preliminary analysis of it, because of course all this is um, you know, case series and wasn't done in a controlled setup. But we've just completed the final outcomes of a randomized compared a, a randomized comparison trial uh, with assessor blinding comparing conventional PDT with ambulatory PDT for BCC and Bowens in 50 subjects. And as you'll see by the nature of the ambulite, uh, the lesions need to be less than 2.4 centimeters. And interestingly, we have indeed shown very low ambulatory PDT scores at 1.55 median score. But um, we were surprised to see that there was actually no significant difference from the conventional cohort, the reason being that the conventional cohort in this study of 50 small lesions uh, also showed rather low pain scores, lower than we'd expect with hospital-based PDT. And this maybe indicates actually that size is a huge factor here, that if you're treating very small, what we would call clean lesions and otherwise not field damaged uh, sites, uh, that your, uh, your PDT scores will be low. However, importantly, we have shown that efficacy of the ambulatory PDT uh, was at least as good at one year follow-up. So this is all very heartening data. Uh, and uh, of course, um, the fact that it allows the patients to have treatment at home is a huge uh, asset. There is quite a lot of other work going on elsewhere. And these are slides very kindly uh, given to me by Serge Morden in Lyon, who's doing this pioneering work de developing conformable light, light emitting fabrics again allowing improved care for patients with PDT, in particular to large areas, uh, allowing it either at home or in a uh, setting of their choice. Turning now to daylight PDT, this is another way really to be able to improve convenience for patients. And there's actually a very extensive evidence base for the use of PDT in dermatology now, using daylight as the light activator. And there's an international consensus and numerous guidelines, in fact, and of course, one of the questions we, we were keen to know is what about its role in not so sunny UK? The work was initiated in Copenhagen, and this is taken from one of the publications of Hans Christian Wolf and Stephen Regal's first papers, doing a half head comparison study showing efficacy rates similar for daylight PDT with conventional PDT for field change actinic keratosis. 
But interestingly, in that study, they showed that the daylight PDT-treated side was much less painful than the red light-treated side. And as I say, there's a lot of literature about this, but just to very briefly summarize the two key most recent uh, multi-center studies that have um, supported the use of daylight PDT for actinic keratosis on the head and uh, neck. And this study uh, was undertaken in Australia in seven centers doing a within-subject comparison of daylight PDT versus conventional PDT for actinic keratosis, showing high efficacy rates at 12 weeks, uh, but much less pain on the daylight treat PDT-treated side. And you'll see here higher pain scores um, uh, representing those patients having large areas treated on head and neck. Comet 2 was basically the same study, but done in Europe, in um, several centers in Europe, uh, again with uh, head and neck actinic keratosis. Their overall efficacy rates were a little lower, and the reason for this was because they included uh, more moderately severe actinic keratosis than in the Australian study, which was predominantly mild AK. But they still showed equivalent efficacy rates between conventional PDT and daylight PDT, and again, much lower pain scores, significantly lower pain scores on the daylight PDT treated sites. And in both of these studies, patients have preferred daylight PDT to conventional PDT with higher patient satisfaction and convenience. So this is how it happens. Uh, we need to apply an absorbent sunscreen to all sites, of course, as dermatologists who spend most of our working lives advising patients with skin cancer and precancer to stay out of the sun. And here they may have a slight question about why we're telling them to go and sit in the sun. Um, so we apply an absorbent sunscreen. We roughly remove any surface gross crusting, and then we apply the Metfix, the methylamide and lipolinic acid to the whole area, and we send patients outside. And just to um, highlight that actually if we look at this, the green is the daylight spectrum. Uh, the um, protocol for nine absorption spectrum we can see here, maximally absorbing in the blue. And in fact, because of the emission spectrum of light and the PP9 absorption spectrum, most of the efficacy of daylight PDT will be derived from blue light PDT, which is fine because actually surface penetration doesn't need to be particularly deep for actinic keratosis, but it would lead to question the potential role of daylight PDT for anything deeper, such as superficial BCC. Um, I mentioned about sunscreen, and it is really important that we use uh, an absorbent sunscreen. And the reason for this is because, of course, we do not want, if you put reflectant agents in there, they'll overlap with the PP9 spectrum and would actually limit the daylight PDT effect. So what about, of course, daylight PDT in Scotland, which uh, is where uh, we are based in the photobiology unit in Dundee. And whilst it's the most delightful place to live, because you have the sky on a sunny day, uh, you know, this is Edinburgh actually in the summer as well. Um, and, uh, we're not renowned for our uh, sunny weather. So we set up Daylight PDT in 2013, and um, we consider, and I'll show you the evidence for, in support of this, that actually the patients that are ideally suited for this are those who've got diffuse field change, thin actinic keratosis on the face and scalp. In particular, we use it if patients have been intolerant or have failed to respond to other conventional treatments or indeed have found conventional PDT to be painful. Um, it's really important that patient selection uh, encompasses patients who are happy and able to comply. And that may sound very obvious, but actually it was one of the things that uh, in our early years with it, we realized the need to provide both very careful verbal but also written instructions for this and to have perhaps a partner or a helper uh, who can help with treatment at home. Uh, and actually it does, it does select for patients who are happy to take some degree of ownership of their treatment. Uh, and this doesn't suit everybody, and uh, it's important that for us as clinicians we recognize those for whom it will uh, be better for. So we would undertake treatment any time in Scotland between April through to October, unless it's raining. Um, and uh, it needs, of course, to be on sites that the patient will be happy to expose to daylight. We would apply the sunscreen, as I mentioned, 10 minutes later or so, we'll roughly prepare the area, apply the Metfix, and then advise them to go outside within 30 minutes, and that's so that the PP9 doesn't build up to the point where treatment may then be painful. And then they expose themselves for two to two and a half hours, uh, wipe off the excess uh, methylamine and lipid acid, and spend the rest of the day indoors. And we follow up and retreat 
uh, dependent on clinical need at one to three months. And our experience, our initial experience, which we've just published actually in the Scottish Medical Journal um, of our first sort of 64 patient treatment courses, um, interestingly, uh, most patients have had about three treatments over a, a summer period. And interestingly, you'll see that our Dundee summer is not particularly hot. Uh, 16 degrees, our median temperature, but, it, but only a, a minority of patients uh, actually um, had treatment interrupted by rain. Uh, some had quite a low dose exposure, but I'll come on to that, and some were treated in the conservatory. Um, so 73% of our patients had either complete clearance or what we deemed as a very good uh, uh, partial response. The median pain score was 1 and virtually all of our patients preferred daylight PDT to other treatments and all of these patients really had come from the position of having failed other treatments such as 5 fluorouracil etc. And all of them would either have it again or recommend it to other people. And uh, uh, we were the first to introduce daylight PDT in Scotland and this just shows the pie chart of those uh, showing those who graded it as excellent. This is a, a gentleman who very kindly took serial photographs of his reaction to daylight PDT and I uh, this was at 27 hours after daylight PDT. He was very exact about it and very helpful. He's been one of our sort of real stoics of our daylight PDT clinic. But he, he, it, what it shows is that actually it picks out subclinical disease, as Alison mentioned earlier, and therefore it can be extremely good for treating these field changes and possibly has a role in prophylaxis in terms of preventing development of overt clinical disease. And our data actually fit with the recent work, which was um, a Galderma-initiated study, uh, an observational study of actually the, the use uh, in practice in Europe of daylight PDT. And this showed high levels of patient and uh, physician satisfaction, and that most would have treatment again. But he had an extremely good response to daylight PDT, as you'll see here, with complete clearance of the actinic keratosis. The benign uh, pigmented freckling and the vascular lesions uh, don't respond to treatment because they're benign, so don't pick up the photosensitizer. And actually, this, he was delighted because he felt he looked fresher and younger. And this is something that several of our patients have reported on, which is, of course, another advantage. And on the back of this, one of the dermatologists who now is a consultant in Inverness, who trained with us in Dundee, has set up daylight PDT in Inverness. So what about those patients who don't get so much uh, light? And as you saw, uh, a significant proportion of our patients did have um, a, a low dose of exposure of effective light, of effective daylight. Uh, and eight joules per centimeter squared is considered in the literature to be the threshold. But interestingly, I point out that most of those still went on and had uh, a very good response. And so because our patients also have multiple treatments, uh, this is not something we worry about too much. We have got the option of sitting in a conservatory, but we lengthen the treatment time by 40 minutes. And just an interesting anecdote, which uh, this was one of our patient feedback questionnaires showing, is uh, he commented it had been blooming freezing, and uh, his wife commented that he needed two hot water bottles to sit outside. So it's just to highlight there are some challenges <laughs> with uh, daylight PDT in Scotland. So work that uh, Dr. Ewan Eady and Dr. Paul Omani and ourselves have done in the photobiology unit in collaboration with PHE and with um, Tom Lister in Salisbury um, was recently published in the BJD. This was using historical illuminance data uh, and actually is a useful guide, I don't have time to go into the details today, showing us that actually we can probably do daylight PDT more widely throughout the year. Um, and for longer periods of the day than we may be historically thought. And actually the whole issue of measuring the amount of light that patients are getting, providing uh, confidence for patients and, for, and practitioners, uh, is an important area of research for us. We <laughs> undertake measurements using these hobometers, um, little photodiode devices to optimise, and this is an area of particular research interest for us. Uh, and just to show some useful um, guidelines for how to do daylight PTT in the UK. So just to finish really, um, I hope I've highlighted some ways in which we can improve convenience, efficacy and com comfort for patients. It allows um, streamlining of conventional PDT services in hospitals and some cost efficacy with that. Um, and this can be facilitated by these lower radiance uh, regimes. But Careful selection of patients is important and it does empower patients to take some ownership of their own treatment. And um, again, this is 
uh, important that all our treatment endeavours are centred around the patient, and certainly we're now engaging patients in uh, proper patient engagement to develop the clinical services. <coughs> thank you. I'd like to just thank Carl Dermot, who uh, sponsored my attendance today. Thank you.